Ladies and gentlemen, we need an in-out referendum. 79 MPs have now signed up to the campaign for an in-out referendum, and nearly 100,000 people around the country have signed up to the People's Pledge, peoplespledge.org. I hope that by the end of this afternoon's discussion, uh, Desmond or any wits lurking at the back might have signed up to the campaign too, and we will have more than 80 MPs signed up for the uh, in-out uh, campaign. The case for an in-out referendum, I think, needs to be made um, very carefully. It's not about the case for coming out. I don't think that we should argue by starting and trying to guess what the outcome would be and then try to work backwards. I think what we need to ask is not, are we better off out? I think the question has to be, is a referendum on this issue right in principle? Is it right in principle that millions of people who make up this country should decide this issue? Or should we leave this issue to the handful of people in Westminster to decide on our behalf? I think we need to put aside, in making the case for a referendum, the case for coming out of the EU. I think we need to put aside the fact that we signed up in the early 1970s to what we thought was a, a prosperous trade bloc. We signed up to a part of the globe that when we joined had 36% of the world's GDP, but by 2012 we'll have less than 15. We need to put that to one side. We need to put to one side the idea that we have, in economic terms, shackled ourselves to a course. I think we also need to put to one side the argument that being in the EU has damaged our politics. We need to put aside the idea that you know, Ian Duncan Smith is having difficulty in delivering on the proposals for universal benefits because of EU rulings that prevent us from assessing whether or not people receiving benefits are entitled to them. We need to, I think, overlook the fact that by being in the European Union, a lot of the localist agenda is made impossible because we cannot disperse and decentralise power while we're governed by the greatest quango of the lot, namely the European Commission in Brussels. Instead, we need to argue the case for a referendum from first principle. Is it right that the political elite and the mandronate in Westminster and Whitehall make decisions that are of profound significance to the rest of us who live in this country. I think that the case for an in-out referendum is a textbook case for us having, that the, the EU is a textbook case for us having a referendum. Number one, the question of our EU membership divides all political parties. You can find people in all of the major political parties who believe we should stay in, and people in all political parties who think we should come out. Secondly, it's not something that can ever really be determined in a general election. It's also, I think, a major constitutional question. If any issue ever qualified for a referendum, I think our membership in the EU surely must qualify. It's also now impossible for people to say what they used to say, which is that somehow referendums were alien to the British tradition. We had a referendum quite recently on, on AV, on electoral reform. How can it be right that we have a referendum to decide under what electoral system MPs are elected, and yet not have a referendum to decide on whether those we elect actually decide how the country is governed? Now, the AV referendum has done more than anything to make the idea of a referendum on Europe possible. <coughs> it divided the government as to whether or not we should keep the electoral system or change to AV. They agreed to disagree and hold a referendum on it. The sky didn't fall down. The sun rose the next day. The government was divided, but it survived because people agreed to abide by what the people decided. Having a referendum on AV, I think, also made the whole idea of a referendum much less wonky, much less obtuse, much less academic. A, a referendum need not be something that you have every 30 years. It can be something that you uh, have when you have a set of local elections or a general election. It's quite easy to allow every adult in the country to decide a public policy issue by holding a ballot paper and deciding yes or no. It's very easy to do it, and I think the AV referendum showed off quite how easily it could be done.
I think the case for a referendum is particularly strong when you bear in mind that all three parties were, until recently, talking about holding a referendum on Europe. In fact, if you read as I have, I think it's page 63 or it could be page 67 of the Liberal Democrat manifesto in the last general election, they were talking about having an in-out referendum on the EU. It was there in the Lib Dem manifesto. The Conservatives were talking about having a referendum on Europe. Labour was talking about having a referendum on Europe. Now, clearly there is going to be a new deal with the European Union. If the European Union, because of the crisis that it's in, falls apart and disintegrates, then obviously there's going to be a different relationship with Europe. But if, on the other hand, the core 17 member states decide to fuse together, then, again, our relationship will be different. Imagine what it would be like if the 17 Eurozone countries were to merge together. Imagine what the impact would be on things like qualified majority voting. Almost whichever way it goes, there is going to have to be a new deal between this country and the European Union. So I think the question is, do we leave it to the Westminster elite and to the Whitehall Mandarinate to decide what that new relationship is? Or should we ultimately ask the people? I think we need to ask the people because whatever the details of the renegotiation, and we could sit here and debate all afternoon as to what the detail of this renegotiation should be, whatever the deal, I don't think we can trust the Westminster elite and the Whitehall Mandarinate to give us the deal that we need. You could almost say that for the past 40 years we've left it to the Westminster elite to negotiate our relations with Europe and, and, and look at the mess that they've made of it. They've left us bailing out a currency that we chose not to join. Mm. We've been subject again and again and again to European policies that give us a raw deal. A common fisheries policy that allows the landlocked member states to vote on fisheries policy that only affect the Atlantic and not the Mediterranean. <coughs> There's talk now of a financial transaction tax. Well, where do you think most of those financial transactions take place? Again and again, if we leave it to the Westminster elite, we find ourselves subject to deals and negotiations that are not in our national interest. So I think ultimately we need a referendum on Europe because we know that we cannot trust the SW1 people to decide what is and what isn't a good deal. For too long, we've had a system of deferential democracy. <laughs> We have left it to the political class in Westminster, who have left it to the Whitehall management. People like Sir Stephen Wall, Kim Darrick, John Cunliffe. Now these, these people are not household names. That is precisely the problem. They have negotiated and made key decisions about this country's future, and they are not accountable to the people in whose name they negotiate. So I think we need to recognize that any new deal any new deal made in our name has to be put to a vote of the people. Now, often when I argue this, people, particularly the SW1 people, will say, well, you know, Douglas, what happens if the people vote to stay in? Well, it's true. Sometimes in life you've got to trust the people. And I'm amazed at how many elected officials seem so reluctant to trust the people. I think we have to trust the people to decide whether it's right for us to stay in or stay out. Now, it's certainly the case that voters quite often turn out to be conservative. Voters, it's true, quite often turn out to reject the grandiose designs of the political class. But what, what is more grandiose a political design than our membership of the European Union, than the whole EU project? I think the argument can be won. I think argument can be won if it's made sensibly, if the argument is made not in terms of being backward looking, not in terms of trying to take this country back to some imaginary past, but if the argument is made in terms of bringing change in this country and in Europe and allowing us to be uh, less insular from the world and more open and more global. Ultimately, Euroscepticism is not about culture. Or identity. It is not about flags or anthems. Ultimately, those of us who are sceptical of the whole EU project are sceptical of the idea that you can arrange a continent of millions of people by deliberate design, by deliberate organisation at the behest of a technocratic elite in Brussels.
Almost every time we have left it to that technocratic elite to arrange Europe's affairs by grand design. Look at what they've done. A fisheries policy with no fish. A European single currency that has brought ruin to millions of Europeans. An agricultural policy that is not in the interests of British farmers. European regulations that ruin small businesses. It is not a question ultimately of, of, of whether we are in or out. It is ultimately a question of whether the European people should be governed by deliberate design by those who are not accountable to them. I think it will not be long before others in Europe also insist on the right to opt out of that.